Now, ultimately, we're going to realise we simply cannot use as much of the planet as we're taking for ourselves. And I think uh, if, if we survive what we're going to go through, and it's an if, not a when we survive, mm -hmm. if we survive as a civilization in any sense whatsoever, I think we're going to have to realise we have to drastically reduce our load on the planet from 1.6 times the planet's reproducible capacity to maybe 0.2 leaving the other 0.8 for the other species on the planet. Uh, now to do that and have anything like a substantial scale of humans, we have to take production off planet. Now, once you do that, which of course involves technology we don't currently have, I'm, it's like I'm, I'm talking about jet travel in 1900. G'day team, welcome to the Field Got Blueprint and to episode 10 of Isolation Intellect Interviews. I'm your host Simon Ma and I created the Feel Good Blueprint to bring together a community of like-minded people to share ideas, tools and resources to help others find their great. I'm really grateful for you tuning in today and if you like what you see or hear, if you could consider subscribing or at least sharing with one friend, that would be epic. My next guest is world-renowned economist Professor Steve Keen. He's a distinguished research fellow at UCL and the author of Debunking Economics and Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? He's one of the few economists to anticipate the global financial crisis of 2008, for which he received the Revere Award from the Real World Economics Review. He is ranked in the Richtopia list of the world's 100 most influential economists. He also designed the open source system dynamics program called Minsky, which is the first program to allow monetary economic models to be designed visually. He has previously been Professor of Economics at Kingston University in London and the University of Western Sydney, Australia. In this episode, we discuss Steve's work and his contribution to the modern economic theory, standing up for your truth and what you believe in, what's going on with the economy at the moment, what has caused where it's got to, and how we can alleviate this in the future, what it means for us as individuals, what it means for businesses and everyone in between, and also how we can avoid a Hunger Games future. This episode is our first venture into finance and the economy, something I'm very interested in, and I'm sure there's some people out there that are really wondering what is happening next and what to make sense of. So you'll find that Steve is very academic in some of his terms. I'll make sure I put them in the description, but it's a very, very overall interest, interesting conversation, and I'd like to thank Steve so much for coming on. Also a word of warning, there is language in this episode, and there is also discussion around financial advice. This financial advice is not to be substituted for your own professional advice by your financial advisor or fiduciary. What I love about Steve is he's not your run-of-the-mill archetype of academic economist. He really sticks it to the man, so to speak, and he speaks out with his heart and with pride. So I'd like to thank Steve so much for jumping on and having a chat with me. It was really, really entertaining and insightful. And without further delay, I hope you enjoy the discussion with Professor Steve King. Good to be here, Simon. Fantastic. I'm very pleased to have some of your time to speak today, uh, particularly given, I guess, um, what's happening at the moment and trying to make sense of some of that. But I just wanted to, um, to dive in uh, to a bit of a background on yourself. If you could just speak to what you've achieved up to date and what you've been up to most recently. <laughs> okay. Well, I've been a critic of mainstream economics for going on half a century now. So if I wanted to uh, situate myself, I was somebody who was persuaded to do a law degree in arts and law at university back in 1971. I uh, did economics as part of it because my real interest was doing economics and engineering. Uh, I very rapidly became horrified with the naive and simplistic mathematics that was a large part of mainstream economics and ended up being a critic leading a student revolt in 1973 against the teaching of economics at Sydney University. Um, complicated career, um, time in journalism, time in um, uh, computer programming, uh, public service for a short while. Ended up going back to do a PhD in economics and what I've done since then is both uh, communicate the critiques. I really didn't develop very many of the critiques myself, but communicating the critiques of mainstream economics, which to some, to take a quote from, um, I think his name, his name is mentioned, an American satirist, uh, economics is neat, plausible and wrong. And I've communicated where it's wrong. And then I've developed uh, non-orthodox approaches to modeling money and energy. And that's my main uh, focus at the moment, doing the economics of climate change where I have found the greatest load of garbage I've ever encountered in the history of economics with the crap that people like William Nordhaus and co put out, which I think is leading the world into an ecological catastrophe. Uh, that's a un, it, it's slightly off, uh, uh, off center, but that's my, my uh, brief bio. 
Great. And um, we were talking just um, off recording before. You've actually, you're in Thailand at the moment. Um, you've found that the, the numbers are best suited to where you are at the moment in terms of what's yeah, happening. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I um, part of my attitude was I wanted, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm, atta I'm attacking mainstream economics on climate change where the, the work is appallingly bad, not just uh, the worst of economics I've, I've encountered in, in 50 years of being a critic of economic theory. And uh, I have looked at the detail of the what the so-called research they've done more than anybody else, it appears. And then I find that this disease is coming around. I thought, well, I, would, I don't want to be collateral damage to this disease before I expose the garbage you people have done that have led, uh, led the world into a, a, what is, is going to be a very uncomfortable corner. So I want to minimize my chances of getting the disease. I, I thought I'd be slowing down how far soon I got it. Uh, but I made the move from uh, the Netherlands to Thailand at a time when the Netherlands was rapidly overtaking Thailand in the number of cases. Now I'm here and it's, uh, Thailand has a total of about 3,040 cases and it's one or two cases a day max and most of those are coming from quarantine. Uh, the Netherlands are now 45,000 cases. So it has, you know, 15 times as many cases with one third as many people. So I think it's quite likely I've managed to avoid the virus and um, I'll con continue staying in Thailand and continue writing my work on exposing the uh, the shot, the disastrously shoddy work that they've done. Yeah, and it's not a bad place to be doing that from either. I could imagine. Oh it's yeah, nice... I mean, <laughs> it is right. The climate, the climate is is bad. This just could backfire me in one in one way, and that uh, it's it, it may well be that the climate is part of why Thailand has been so successful so early, because uh, it literally was number two after China in the number of cases when the virus first began. Now it's about number 70 or 80 in terms of global numbers of, uh, of cases. And that's partly because the virus survives for less time outside the body uh, when in high temperature and high humidity. And this place has got both of those in spades. Uh, but the negative, of course, at some point, we're going to get to what are called wet bulb temperatures exceeding 35 degrees Celsius. And this is not the worst part of the world for that, but it's one of one of the places which is likely to experience it. So I might have been out of the frying pan into the uh, uh, in, not in, not into the into the uh, fire, but into this into this, the uh, sauna. That, <laughs> that could backfire on me. Here's the hoping you get more temperate weather. Um, so yeah, I, I need I, to move. I need to move locations. Yeah, <laughs> maybe over to the islands. Um, Steve, I've been doing some research on you, and you know, I think one of the the great things that uh, so sort of that doctrine of thought that you come from is, and, and what people have probably lab labelled you as is sort of this re renegade of ec uh, economics. And, you know, I see you as this, uh, like you described yourself, sort of this economist in a leather jacket. And you, you, you come up against a lot of the, the mainstream itself. And um, what, what has it been like coming up against some of those mainstream doctrines of thought? Um, you get treated as a crank by people who don't realize that they are cranks themselves. And um, it's very frustrating because um, uh, they, they accept a whole range of things that I think you simply can't accept that assumption, okay? You cannot make that assumption. Oh, what's wrong with making that assumption? It's a simplifying assumption. And I said actually in, in Brisbane one day at a conference of the American, uh, what's called the Western Economic Association, which had their conference in Brisbane that year, uh, uh, after having an uh, interjection from a, a typical young neoclassical uh, when I gave my presentation. And I, he said, we've got to make some simplifying assumptions. And I said, mate, you've got to learn the difference between a simplifying assumption and a fantasy. Um, but of course, they make the fantasy. They're, they're the majority or the minority, and they think you're the idiot for not accepting what they think is a simplifying assumption. And, um, uh, and, and so it's very, very frustrating. And at the same time, you you sort of wonder how on earth do people get be, be so deluded to believe this garbage. Um, but they are, and you, you're the outsider. So it's a very lonely existence. Um, there are, in terms of how one survives as an academic economist who's critical of the mainstream, uh, there's about one in six economists who are outside the mainstream. Neoclassical think it's one in a hundred or one in 200. Okay? And they think there's split into about 30 different little factions and they're totally irrelevant. In fact, the, I prefer to do everything with a bit of empirical research behind it. And in France, in about 2012, a group of French critical uh, uh, academics put out a call for a new division in the French system. French system is very hierarchical. So they have an economics division, 
anti-philosophy and, and, and English and, and uh, you know, culture of science, blah, blah, blah. You registered at a top level as an academic and you get allocated to a university and they actually know how many engineers there are, how many physicists, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there are 1,800 academic economists, not that 1,800, 300 applied to join the new association. Now, it wasn't formed. It was actually shot down by a neoclassical, uh, a French neoclassical uh, Nobel Prize winner. Um, but that's one in six. So that's how many people are a part of the, a part of the uh, rebels. Now, of that one in six, about about 50% of what are called post-Keynesian economists, and I'm largely associated with that crowd. The rest are a whole bunch, mainly Austrian, some Marxian, uh, other groups that are called institutional evolutionary economists and so on. Um, so we keep ourselves alive because we know we're not, we're not the only person with the critical views, but it is a very lonely and isolated experience to be a critic of the mainstream. And um, the only salve is that you think, well, ultimately that the mainstream based on a whole set of delusions, it's got to come unstuck at some levels. And then that's when we pounce. Uh, but then what happens is they go from laughing about you behind your back to trying to shaft you. So there's, there's no real peace for being a critic of the mainstream. Yeah. It's interesting because I know you've gained a lot of momentum, which we'll discuss a bit later, but for you, um, how do you maintain that level of, um, I suppose, resistance and, and passion and momentum yeah, uh, as a minority group in, in that lonely existence, how do you r remain sort of, I suppose, uh, re charged from within? Um, I think it, it comes down to what having what Australians call a good bullshit detector. <laughs> You'd be aware of the expression. Yeah. And uh, I just, when I hear something that's bullshit, something happens in me and I think that's bullshit. And I just, you know, I can't sit there and, and tolerate it. I did actually accept mainstream economics back when I was at high school. I swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. Um, and I was anti-union, which is normally a product of being, of believing in neoclassical economic, of regard unions as distorting the market outcome, anti-monopoly, that it goes with this, exactly the same thing, anti-union. Um, but I had a logical flaw pointed out to me in my one of my first year lectures by a guy called Frank Stilwell, uh, which showed that if you were two steps from perfection, so if you had unions bargaining against uh, monopoly employers, and you remove one of those elements, so you took the union away, what would happen? Well, according to conventional economic theory, in a theory called the theory of the second best, the result would you make the world worse off. You produce human welfare below what it was when you had both unions and monopolies. And I remember thinking, that's crazy, because what seemed like an absolutely watertight argument against unions suddenly becomes an argument in favour of unions once you make the acceptance, well, yes, there are large, powerful employers out there. And if you take if you weaken the workers by taking away the capacity to bargain collectively, then you make, according to economic theory, you make the situation worse. That's fragile. There's something intellectually fragile about this discipline. I've got to find out what it is. And then I went inside the journals and found a whole range of intellectual disputes within economics, which were not being talked about in lectures. It began with what's called the Cambridge controversies, which were a battle between Cambridge, UK and, uh, the Institute of, of the, the um, MIT, which is based in Cambridge, uh, in uh, Boston, in Boston, Massachusetts, um, where they were fighting over the very definition of capital. Mm -hmm. And reading the literature, not only was obvious to me that the, the critics won, it was obvious to Paul Samuelson that the critics won. And yet, you read Samuelson's textbook, and there was no reference to it. And even worse than other textbooks, and I thought this is a mendacious discipline. This is lying to people about the foundations of its own research. So given all that, my bullshit detector was ringing loud and clear. And even though I admit I got personally abused, uh, which certainly has happened, and ridiculed in general, uh, I thought, look, I just can't put up with this bullshit. And so in, in that sense, I'm not putting myself anywhere near this level uh, in, in terms of impact on humanity and, and, and intellect and so on. But I can understand how Copernicus felt when he was fighting with Ptolemaic astronomers about the nature of the universe. And he was the one being derided. He would have been ridiculed, uh, not just by the church, as people normally think, but also by his fellow astronomers, who, by the way, did some extremely serious intellectual work. It's not easy to build a model of a set of spheres on spheres on spheres, which actually matches the data you see in the, in the, in the solar system with the planets rotating around the sun. 
making it look as if they're rotating around the earth. That's bloody hard work. Yeah. And they were insulted to be told they were wasting their fucking time, but they were wasting their fucking time uh, with a model that, that fitted the data and was completely wrong. And that's pretty much what a senior classical economist doing. And they treat me about as, uh, not quite as warm as, as the toll maker astronomers treated Copernicus, but uh, there are similarities. Yeah, and equally to your, your discussions and dialogues that, that you have that really push the, that sort of, um, that I suppose the, um, the, the dialogue around uh, being able to get your point across, a lot of that is in the writing as well. So, you know, you've mm -hmm. got over 80 uh, refereed publications, you've got two books, you've got a range of articles that you have put out um, across a range of different platforms as well. So you speak really strongly with your writing as well which we'll also get to a bit later. What's your approach to your writing in, in sort of finding the source of truth? Good question. Um, I think the, I come from a family which writes well, and that has to be said. My, my mother writes beautifully, uh, did write beautifully. My side so did my father, though my father was very taciturn. And a capacity with language runs for the entire family. You've, you know, my, my nephew, Ben, Mm -hmm. If you ever get letters from Ben, I mean, Ben's got a bit of a conspiracy theory side to him. I, I rip him out for that sort of stuff, but he writes extremely well. So it runs in the family. That's one thing I've got to say, first of all. Uh, then I spend a large amount of time at school doing debating. So we would have um, uh, the, the, the school debating. So, you know, you, 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 you represent the school debating against another school. And I was normally the third speaker where you've got to basically take the opposition's case and try to demolish it. Uh, and then you've also got to summarize your own case succinctly and you have you know we started off with four minutes i think for the entire thing when you're in year seven uh, by the time i got to year 10 you had 10 minutes uh, that in a sense gave me a way to try to present and engage an audience live uh, and to be succinct and uh, and i think that i write the way i speak and i think that's uh, the, the combination of the family background and the debating uh, honed those skills yeah, definitely. When I was reading, um, can we avoid another financial crisis? I definitely got that straight to the point sort of, uh, uh, that, that, that tone that you do use, which I think is fantastic, you know, and that's very necessary for what, when you're trying to fight these kind of battles, so to speak, um, especially what we've, what I can see in your debates as well that you've had online. I particularly referenced the one you had about with that gentleman about Bitcoin recently, which we'll also talk about a bit later as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Minsky program you've developed and also, yeah, sure. also Patreon as well and how that interlocks. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, Minsky is something that I came up with, uh, because part of my mathematical training was in differential equations and I loved them. I thought that was, uh, I first learned them at, at school, uh, from a brilliant, uh, teacher. Uh, in, in one year, actually in economics, he taught me Rostow's theory of growth. His name was actually Tim Keating, no relation to Paul Keating, <laughs> yeah. but he taught me uh, Rostow's theory of growth was actually the process of growth, which means rates of change. And I was looking forward to that. I did, I did differentiation. I did very well at mathematics at school as well. And I was looking forward to that stuff. And then I studied mathematics while I was at first year university with a brilliant lecturer called Williams, Professor Williams at Sydney Uni. And uh, even though I hated the guy teaching the applied mathematics, I loved differential equations. And they, did, they weren't to be seen in economics. In fact, I've just been reading a, a, what's called an advanced tech, uh, textbook by uh, Th Thomas Sargent, who's one of the leading neoclassicals. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize for developing what they call rulers of cycle models. And he has two textbooks which are online. You can search them and find them. I'll, I'll send you a link to them. They, don't, they mention differential equations precisely once. Mm -hmm. In the so-called advanced textbook, they use difference equations instead, which is technically backward. Anyway, I um, got myself trained in that area. I thought that what you'd be doing to do decent economics is applying differential equations, uh, which rates of change out of equilibrium, non-equilibrium non dynamics. And uh, my, first, my first major publication in that area was building a model of Minsky's, um, Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And then I discovered this product called system dynamics programs, which are programs that use flow charts to build models of dynamic processes. So rather than having to show the actual differential equation, you have a flow chart. Here's a flow, it goes into a stock, increments the stock, and the level of that stock then affects uh, flows to other stocks and you have a, a dynamic feedback process. And I thought that was fabulous software. I used one of the programs, which is actually an engineering program called VizSim for quite some time. Uh, but I tried to, 
model my models of money creation in that and what, because you have a flow and we going you have a, a slow going from one stock to another uh, it was very easy in BizSim to make a mistake and to not have the same terms for what, for the like for the recipient account that you had for the for the source account and i finally realized courtesy of working with a guy called win godley uh, who developed the whole approach called stock flow consistent modeling uh, that, made, that dominates non-orthodox economics um, I, I realized i could use one of his tables to show the flows so but there was no software package that in, had those tables embedded so uh, with a bit of help from the institute for new economic thinking financial help and working with a, a long-term friend of mine who's a top-class mathematician and uh, computer programmer, we built Minsky to include differential equations generated not just by the usual flowchart um, patterns of of, uh, of system dynamic programs, but using double entry bookkeeping. So I built Minsky to enable not just modeling of of, of uh, standard stocks and flows, which you can do with with the flows like Vensim, BizSim. Uh, Mathematica has one called uh, um, System Modeler. There's about 20 programs out there, the dominant one being put out by MATLAB, who write a program. They have, MATLAB dominates the numerical uh, uh, programming side of computing, and it has a package called Simulink. And if, if virtually anything you've hopped inside that's been designed by an engineer in the last 10 years has been first of all designed in Simulink, virtually certainly. So it dominates engineering. And uh, what I've done is produce uh, Minsky uh, as a way of doing the same modeling in economics by making it possible to model the monetary flows. So um, yeah, it's been an interesting experience writing my own. I didn't write the software, I, I, I design it in that sense. I'm the designer of the program and Russell Standish is the, is the builder. So I'm the architect and he's the builder. And it's been a marvelous experience writing it. Uh, I've learned a lot about money by writing Minsky. Great. And, and you're one of the first, if not the first economists to, to um, be funded by the Patreon side of things as well, which I know. Yeah, I yeah that's true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that came about because uh, Kingston University was forced into downsizing by uh, following the uh, Australian government idea to deregulate first year in student intake, which completely screwed the low rank universities, including Kingston in the UK. And, uh, I was actually putting together a Patreon phone campaign to raise money for Minsky. And then I realized I had to raise it for myself instead. And now I'm pretty much getting my professorial salary uh, from Patreon. So I've got about uh, 1,500 subscribers giving me about nine and a half thousand US dollars a month. And it means I can be an independent scholar, and which is fantastic. And just one little thing I want to emphasize, most of my posts are publicly available. They're not behind a paywall. The only stuff behind a paywall on my podcast with Phil Dobby, and that's because Phil is making a living out of this. He's, um, he, he did not his entire living, obviously, but uh, he gets 10% of my Patreon revenue. So, of course, we have to restrict podcasts. But most of when I asked my patrons, the early ones, do they want me to be behind a paywall or publicly available? They said definitely publicly available because we want your non orthodox views to be more widely accepted. Yeah. And that means make your post available physically, because that's what we do. Great, and we'll we'll send a link down in the in the bio to make sure everyone can access that as well to see your work, because I know you share a lot of things, and I've had a look at that as well. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go into the economy, and I, I'm not going to ask a question as simple as what is going on with the economy, but I guess let's rewind back to your your predictions of the GFC, which you you accurately predicted, and then I saw a video as well um, at the end of last year where you were talking about 2020. Um, and you'd, you'd, you'd accurate, accurately predicted a form of decline, um, obviously not being aware of what kind of decline that we'd have now, which we're in. Um, what, where we are right now, how is, it, how is it different from what you predicted for 2020 and compared oh, to the GFC? Oh, look, totally different. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I, I was focusing uh, in terms of saying, like I, I read a post which was actually supporting a bit of a joke. I did a podcast with Dan Illick, is a very good Australian comic. You're probably aware of Dan, and he he was having a bit of fun with the fact that they were changing prime ministers. You know, pretty much like you were changing bath towels. Oh yeah, uh, which is actually pretty good. Maybe after, after yep. you know, actually change, change toilet rolls is closer to it. Same with um, but, anyway, but anyway, he he's establishing a you know the old you know, ring up and, and get the telephone, get the time on the telephone. But yep. he used to do that, uh, it's like a one eight hundred number, and it was one eight hundred. Uh, who the fuck is prime minister? <laughs> 
I thought that was a brilliant idea. And he yeah. said, if, you'd 500, if you could donate 500 bucks towards him getting the number, then he'd give you a go on his podcast. Well, I thought it was just too funny not to do it. So I signed up for the 500 bucks. And then to make a bit of a joke post, I said, well, actually winning the next election would be a really bad idea. Now, what I was expecting was the end of the Australian housing bubble. Okay, yeah. Now, that got completely blown out of the water um, by, of all things, the Royal Commission because the Royal Commission exposed how disastrously bad their behavior had been. And the banks instantly tried, started to pretend to be, to be responsible. You had the, the Royal Commission, first of all, exposed how irresponsible banks have been in their lending, uh, with Rowena Orr, the barrister, totally skewering the bank officials. And in panic mode, they went into pretending to be responsible after that. But then the Treasury wrote the final submission of the Royal Commission and completely cauterized the whole thing and basically said, please get back to irresponsible lending, which of course is what the banks have done. So the housing bubble took off again, particularly after Morrison unexpectedly won the election. But my joke uh, point was, it's going to be a bad year to win and you're better off to let the bloke you don't like win because he's going to get mugged by reality. Well, the mugging by reality that actually happened really began with the fires. And that was something uh, I didn't anticipate the fires themselves, but I do expect catastrophically bad, bad, bad climate change to come away in the next decade. So I thought in that sense, Morrison got what he deserved and handled it appallingly badly. But of course, the coronavirus can be related to climate change as well in the sense that by making ourselves the dominant species on the planet, we've made ourselves the most likely location for a uh, pathogen to develop. So mm. If a pathogen develops that affects African lions, it'll die with them because we're wiping them out by taking away their habitat. Mm. But if a pathogen develops in humans, you beauty, it can hop on a plane and fly anywhere on the planet, which is precisely what uh, coronavirus has done. But the, having said that, I must say that even though he started off very badly, Morrison and his mob have ended up probably harnessing part of the Australian culture to do as well as they have done. It's not part of the culture you'll, you'll, you'll be familiar with until I point it out to you. Um, but that's the obsequience to, to authority. Yeah. Because when, when an Australian policeman tells you to slow down, you damn well slow down. Yeah. And we have a, we have a history of being a police state. Uh, I know we, we tend to forget this, but we started as convicts. Well, you don't, and we think of ourselves as a convict nation, but for, you don't have convicts without waters. Yeah. And uh, so Australia is dominated by two social classes, those that came from the convicts and those came from the waters. And the waters are definitely in control right now. And when they tell you, you, you can't go out, you don't go out. So even though we pride ourselves on being a larrikin nation, we tend to be very uh, obedient larrikin nation. And the lockdown was applied very forcefully here. Again, the waters are used to telling the convicts what to do. Um, so we had a very strict lockdown. And, and having put, put it on a negative light, I've got to say as well, it was done extremely well, uh, by the, particularly by the states too. Um, for example, not letting people travel from one state to another. That's part of being effective in a lockdown like this because you don't transmit the virus from one spot to another. I just noticed that um, I think there was a, a new case of coronavirus in New Zealand, I think it was. And what it was was somebody who was given a waiver from quarantine. Uh huh. There you go. Okay. You yeah. don't make that sort of mistake. That's, that's one of the few mistakes New Zealand has made. But in general, by locking down the states, locking down the towns, not traveling as well, that's why Australia's wiped it out. So I, I didn't expect anything as bad as this. Though. I mean, uh, uh, when I saw it coming, and I saw it coming very early, I was actually following it right from December, courtesy of some of the non-Orthodox people in finance that I follow, one of them being having a PhD in medicine. Uh, he, was, he saw the information about the virus and said, this is going to be a big one. And then I was following it right from pretty much the end of December. So I knew something catastrophic was coming and that's why I made the personal move to Thailand. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, um, this is not the crisis that I expected, yeah. uh, but what it's, what it's meant is that something I've put forward to solve the crisis I did expect, uh, is now much more relevant. That's what I call a modern debt jubilee. Yeah, I've heard, uh, yeah, I've read about the modern debt ju jubilee as well. But we saw some some really similar action in um, Asia and in Europe as well in terms of strictness. In the UK, it was a much much more relaxed um, approach, and it still is. And we've seen the numbers as they are. And in the states, it's a whole different story. But uh, overall, we're seeing you know businesses shut down. We're seeing a lack of um, consumer spending. You know, what 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 is the the long term effects of this? 
Well, it could be quite disastrous because of the level of private debt we're following. And that, that's why I'm pushing the idea of a modern debt jubilee, uh, because the mainstream economists ignore the level of private debt. And that's because they think lending is from one saver, from a saver to a lender with a bank, uh, the saver to a borrower, with the, uh, the bank just being an intermediary. That's how they describe, they describe banks as intermediaries. Um, that is simply technically wrong. And in 2014, the Bank of England published a paper called Modern Money Creation in the Modern Economy that quite explicitly said the textbooks are wrong. But people who believe the textbooks still dominate economic theory and economic policy. So they have ignored the level of private debt. Now, I've looked, it, 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 it's just, private debt plays an essential role in Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. So I've been looking at the dynamics of private debt since 1987 and modeling it as well. And what causes a financial crisis is the slowdown of the rate of growth of debt. And if you look at America's data, it went from debt growing at the rate of 15% of GDP at the peak of the boom to minus five at the depth of the crisis. That's what caused the financial crisis. But in the aftermath, what they've, what they've tried to do is to get back to having as much credit creation as occurred before the crisis. They've been unsuccessful. But what it's meant is the level of debt's only fallen in America's case from 170% of GDP to 150%. Now, when the crisis hit, uh, this crisis, uh, you, that level of debt is three times as much debt to, to GDP as applied back during the Spanish flu. And, and at the same time, this crisis, because we had the lockdown, it, it meant that workers were told you can't go to work. Uh, and most workers have got less than enough money in the bank account to cover one month of, of, of expenses. Uh, so without any income coming in, they were screwed. They couldn't pay the rent, they couldn't pay the mortgages. And corporations weren't getting cash flow either. They had to extend their, per, their levels of debt. So short-term commercial loans in the States increased by roughly a trillion dollars, which is, which is about, it's in terms of the level of debt I'm looking at there, it's about a 30% increase from two to three trillion dollars increase in debt, just basically accessing lines of credit to stay alive. So I saw a massive wave of bankruptcy coming after this crisis. Yeah. And the, only, the way to prevent it is to reduce the level of private debt. And we can do that by using the government's money creation capability to make uh, in, equal injection to everybody's personal bank accounts, um, exactly the same amount of money to you, to me as to Rupert Murdoch. Uh, if you're in debt, you must pay your debt level down, must reduce your debt. If you're not in debt, you get a cash injection that cash injection could be used to, to for, you could require people to buy corporate shares, which are also must be used to pay private debt down. So you could reduce both household and corporate debt, but you could also have that as a form of monetary stimulus. So I've argued for that um, as, as a way of avoiding a financial crisis after the, after the coronavirus crisis, but it's been done to some extent by the, um, by some of the governments in terms of providing uh, in income flow, Australian has done that as well. The UK has done it pretty well. Um, that's given people cash flow to pay their commitments now, but they're accumulating further commitments, which will hit them in the future. Maybe not even, you know, obviously not, not before the crisis ends, but maybe when we're still having the, the medical crisis, we'll have a financial crisis as well. So I, I can see a way around it, which is to effectively replace debt-based money which is bank created money with government created money by a modern debt jubilee. Um, but it's still, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking outside the corridors of power that listen to people like Dominic Cummings rather than me. Uh, so it's unlikely to happen. Yeah. And that, 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 uh, modern ju uh, debt jubilee, uh, that theory that you put forward, I think it makes a lot of sense to me. What, what's going to happen do you think in, in the, in the real situation, you know, in, in terms of what the mainstream will try and put in place? Okay, well, what will happen is most likely an unexpected financial crisis, moderately unexpected because they do have some awareness about the impact of private debt now, uh, that people are going to be going bankrupt. Um, there's already a wave of foreclosures happening in Southern American states right now. Um, so people are going to be foreclosed on because they can't pay the, pay the rent. Uh, of a, the mortgage, people will get, you know, there'll be mortgagee sales because mortgagors can't meet the mortgage. Um, so and you're going to want the economy to revive at a time when people are going bankrupt. Yeah. And then and you're like saying, oh, sorry, please. Yeah. yeah. We saw Hertz fail just recently. Of course, that's the other thing. Yeah. Many businesses which were successful before the coronavirus can't be successful after airlines are obviously in that situation. 
park our companies, hotels, even you know, restaurants, uh, a huge range of businesses are going to suffer really badly. And the only way you can help them survive or transition to other forms of business without dragging the rest of the corporate sector down is by government money creation being injected into private bank accounts. And, and in your book, um, in your most recent book, you've mentioned a lot around these uh, debt zombies. You know, you've spoken extensively about this and these countries um, that uh, essentially have off put the GFC and have been able to get through uh, a lot of that, uh, that, that downturn uh, mo and moving towards the coronavirus crisis. Do you think a lot of that will unfold and become unwoven? Well, I mean, that's the country of Australia and Canada are two obvious examples there. South Korea was also one that was in the dead zombie world. France is another one that's a, a similar situation. So these are countries which continued to borrow private, private money uh, while the GFC hit, whereas others went into reverse. So the UK hit a peak level of private debt, I think of 193% of GDP. It's now down to about 165%. Japan's gone from 225% to about 160. America's from 170 to 150% of GDP is the country that actually experienced the GFC and had a crisis back and how a low, lower level of private debt now. Countries that didn't have a bad crisis at the time did it because they continued borrowing private money into existence and spending it and basically inflating housing bubbles. So they are going to be particularly vulnerable after this crisis occurs. And Australia and Canada are two of the classics there. Uh, they are also likely to suffer in terms of uh, less sales to China and less real estate purchases from China. Certainly for Canada, that's going to be the case. Uh, France, uh, the, the, the stagnation in France will get worse because um, they've, they've gone from about 170% to 210% of GDP at their private debt level, mainly the corporate sector doing the borrowing there. Uh, you're going to reach the ceiling, uh, you, know, you max out ultimately. And when you do, credit-based demand disappears and then you have a stagnant economy, not because of secular stagnation, but because of credit stagnation. So, and that's going to be doubly bad now when of course um, the coronavirus is going to make that credit stagnation even worse because you haven't got cash flow coming in, you can't service anything. Uh, you're, you're basically going to go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And Steve, for, for the general public, you know, for, for the bulk of the public that is working for a corporation or small business or owns a small business or as a contractor, do you have any particular advice for, for people that um, are trying to make sense of this and how they could prepare for the next, you know, say it's 12 to 24 months? No, oh, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, it's not easy to prepare for because um, you, know, you, you have to have cash coming in to be able to prepare for anything. Mm. Uh, I actually advised people initially before the government started providing uh, cash flow uh, you know, through the various schemes that some governments have done, just don't pay your rent. Because if you, if you don't have any cash flow coming in and you've got enough money to pay a month's rent or feed the kids, feed the kids. Yeah. Um, and then if you have a massive defaults coming afterward, then it's going to be hard to evict you. But of course, in America, uh, they tend to do that whether it's hard or not. The, the bailiff, the sheriff turns up and you get evicted. Um, so an organized rent strike is the only way to go for that sort of thing. Uh, but it hasn't particularly been done. So we're, as individuals, we're very weak against the power of the financial sector. So the best thing you can actually do is probably campaign for, for candidates who are, to, who are willing to take on the financial sector. Now, of course, they're few and far between. Bernie Sanders was in that boat to some extent. Uh, the Labor Party had, had Corbyn, who got completely shafted. That's now gone. You've got Boris Johnson as well. Congratulations there. Um, so it, it's very hard for individuals to do anything in this situation. Um, the, you, know, you could argue, for example, if you're, in, if you're in financial assets, get out and get into cash. But at the same time, what's likely to happen with the uh, government rescue programs, are they going to rescue the financial sector and inflate share values? And we've seen that happening. We've had a huge increase in share prices after the initial crunch from the virus, uh, while the real economy has been physically tanked. So the level of separation between the physical economy and the real has got even more ridiculous uh, in the last two months than it was beforehand. So personal advice is pretty damn difficult. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm lucky to have been in a situation where my cash flow has actually improved. I didn't expect that, but it has through Patreon. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if you're you know, relying on a wage uh, where you're just you're no longer able to work um, it would be, and, and then you're going back into work again and you're not, you might actually have you know, 
insufficient demand to hire you or you know, pay cuts, et cetera, et cetera. It's, there's nothing really individual can do in that situation. It's going to be a difficult time overall, I guess. Mm. Yeah. And then we, I, I guess through this, we're seeing what, what I'm seeing is a lot of companies moving much quicker to, to AI usage and automation. Um, and I know you've, you've written some papers around that, particularly around production and, and energy usage. Do you have a view on, on what's happening and what we could see in the future with companies responding to this kind of situation? Well, I think climate change is going to get there first. Okay. Unfortunately, we're going to be forced to go into a drastic reduction in the amount of energy we consume on the planet. And, and that'll be that type of uh, decline in output that applies rather than the technology of transformation we are capable of. But what I see ultimately happening is the only way that we can survive as an industrial species uh, in the long term, I'm talking over the next century, is to take production off planet. Uh, we are we we have totally strained the bio, the, the the biosphere uh, with the level of production we've generated. We're uh, you, are you are you aware of what's called the human ecological footprint? Uh, sort of not not fully acquainted. Okay, it's a, it's it's attempt by a researcher about twenty years ago to quantify the load we put on the planet by converting all human activities into uh, a number of hectares, and then saying how many hectares of reproducible uh, capacity of the planet is each person consuming and it includes the carbon footprint as well but even if you take the carbon footprint out uh, and uh, like ignore if you do do what a, a climate change and I would want to do and argue that carbon dioxide you know helps us grow more plants which is garbage but that's the sort of crap they come out with um, it actually makes more woody plants which don't produce as much of the stuff we actually want from plants as it happens so it'll make them less useful for humans not more um, but if you leave that out we're still using 80 percent of the reproducible capacity of the planet every year for humans alone for the remainder of the animal species get 20 percent of the planet's capacity without including the impact we're doing of climate change and then when you include that we're using 1.6 planets per year so in that situation uh, and I think it's, I think we're seeing it starting to happen already. The fires in Australia in, that was only six months ago. Remember yeah. how bad those fires were? That's six months ago. California is about to go through a similar experience again now. Um, uh, we're, we're seeing a, a whole range of climate breakdowns. The huge um, uh, hurricane that just hit, a uh, monsoon that just hit India a couple of days ago. Uh, we know the storms, they may get less storms. They may move more slowly, but they'll be much more destructive. So that storm had winds of 180, I think 180 miles an hour. It slowed down before it went ashore, but it basically wiped out a large part of India and Bangladesh. More and more of that sort of stuff's going to happen. Now, ultimately, we're going to realize we simply cannot use as much of the planet as we're taking for ourselves. And I think uh, if, if we survive what we're going to go through, and it's an if, not a when we survive, mm -hmm. if we survive as a civilization, in any sense whatsoever. I think we're going to have to realize we have to drastically reduce our load on the planet from 1.6 times the planet's reproducible capacity to maybe 0.2, leaving the other 0.8 for the other species on the planet. Uh, now to do that and have anything like a substantial scale of humans, we have to take production off planet. Now once you do that, which of course involves technology we don't currently have, I'm, it's like I'm, I'm talking about jet travel in 1900, okay? Um, you know, we can envisage that being feasible with future technological development, mine asteroids, use solar energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we do that, then we can survive as a species. But of course, you can't expect to get an income out of a wage because you won't be earning one. Yeah. Okay. A huge amount of mechanization obviously has to happen to have anything like that taking place. And in that situation, unless you have a form of universal basic income, so everybody gets enough to live comfortably uh, within the constraints of, of our productive capabilities. And if you want to earn more than that, then you've got to innovate somehow. Um, but in that sort of world, uh, workers will get nothing. Okay, the, 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 the rec wage won't be there anymore as a way of making income. It'll all be machinery, technology, robots, et cetera, et cetera. So unless we democratize to some degree, the, the money, the wealth being generated by that, we're going to, we face a Hunger Games future. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm a fan in the long term of universal basic income. I, I know a lot of my non-orthodox friends push what they call a, a job guarantee. Uh, but that presumes a continuation 
of being able to earn a living by working. And I think in a century's time, if we survive what we're going through, that won't be feasible. Yep. And the UBI is on my, my list of questions, but I just want to rewind to a, a comment you make around um, the fact that, you know, we, we, we've got these catastrophic levels of output in terms of um, our carbon footprint. Now, we've seen in the last couple of months, we're, we're able to achieve much lower levels, but this was forced by a pandemic. Um, and the economy is predicated on growth, which is one of the main reasons that we have this, this kind of carbon output. Mm. So I guess, um, you know, what, what would need to change? What, what fundamental changes can we make? And is it even possible? Well, this is the thing. I mean, uh, a lot of people are talking about, uh, you know, green growth, et cetera, et cetera, as if we can, if we can actually uh, transition from um, um, carbon-based energy sources to non-carbon and maintain the same level of uh, output as we currently do and grow from that level. I think that's a fantasy. Um, if you look at the uh, amount of energy we consume in terms of the, the, the you know, the, um, the, the level of power stations that are necessary, even though we've now got much, much more efficient solar cells and it does look feasible that solar cells can generate ultimately enough in the energy we need to replace uh, coal fired power stations. They're only producing about five, if at best 5% of our total energy needs. So if we find we simply have to shut coal power stations down and that's quite a feasible reaction, certainly in the next 30 years, we don't have the power, the energy uh, production through non-carbon based to be able to maintain the same level of output. So I expect we're going to be forced to reduce our energy consumption. And by being forced to reduce any consumption, we have to reduce our output as well. And particularly if we find we have to actually go negative, but we, uh, we, we want to actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, actively do so, not adding to it, actively remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, then it's going to take energy to do that. Okay, energy which you wouldn't be able to use for producing uh, commodities as well. So I expect a dr dramatic reduction in human living standards being essential, uh, whether we like it or not, in the next 30 years. Yeah. And then on universal basic income, we're, we're seeing a, a lot of countries, we're seeing particularly Australia and UK, for example, we're seeing these job keeper and these furlough schemes come into play. People are just um, getting used to being paid from the government to be able to just exist for the next few months while this happens. Um, what, what ideas do you have around universal basic income? And is it, is it a, a likelihood that could, that could come into play in the next X amount of years? Uh, I think it is feasible because that's the, basically the government giving a you know, payment to everybody independent of whether they're working or not, which is sufficient to be able to cover basic costs of living. Um, and, and in that, that is one, one, one essential for there is to reduce the level of private debt because uh, with the level of debt people are carrying, the amount they need to be paid to sustain that debt is a large amount of money. And we need to reduce the burden and the financial sector puts on the rest of the society rather than increase it. So it's feasible. Um, but it would then mean we, the level of consumption you'd be covering, if we're doing it in the context of realising we have to drastically reduce our load on the planet, then you wouldn't be giving the people enough to, to buy, you know, a new, uh, a new sports jacket every week. Uh, there would be, it would be, really would be a basic income mm -hmm. simply to provide the, the, you know, the level of calorie intake, the capacity to ha have shelter, uh, energy, uh, the basic household energy use, um, it, it, it would not be um, a, uh, you know, you want to lie back on the beach and enjoy it level of income. Yeah. So it's feasible. And I'm glad that I'm glad the coronavirus is doing a lot of things very rapidly that I thought would be very hard to, to argue for. So for example, one thing you'd need to do is say, well, the central bank should directly fund what the treasury does. Now that was heresy uh, all until all about uh, six or eight weeks ago when the Bank of England started doing precisely that. So um, it, the, the, the coronavirus has taught us we can do some things which were said to be off limits or impossible uh, before the coronavirus hit. But the scale of change is still enormous. And I know people won't agree to it. Uh, it won't be something they do voluntarily, just like they didn't do the lockdown voluntarily. But when you're told you've got two choices, you can lock down or you can die, which do you prefer? Mm -hmm. uh, when it hit with an ultimatum like that, that's when people's behavior tends to change. Yeah. 
And then just really quickly, I wanted to touch on the madhouse that is the stock market. It's, mm. It seems so incredibly detached from what's happening in the real world at the moment. I mean, for example, you know, we're seeing the NASDAQ almost up to the same levels it was pre-crisis. Mm. Um, do you have any comment as to what do you think is happening with that and, and what's to come with the stock market? Well, I think a lot of it is still the continuation of QE uh, because QE was actually literally designed to drive up, uh, <coughs> pardon me, drive up share market prices. And mm -hmm. unlike most uh, things designed by neoclassical economists, it actually had the effect they intended. Because if you think about QE, uh, the American QE is the best example. American QE uh, was the, was the uh, Federal Reserve saying it was going to be on the buy side of its open market operations to the tune of $80 billion per month which is roughly a trillion dollars per year. So they basically told the financial sector, you know, we, we normally, they normally buy and sell uh, bonds off the financial sector all the time to try to um, stabilize the interest rate, their target rate. But here they said, we are going to be, um, we are going to be buying this money off you uh, to the tune of $80 billion uh, per, <coughs> per, pardon me, per, um, per month, a trillion dollars per year. Well, that means, they're buying pieces of paper off the financial sector, which have got a notional value of a trillion dollars. They're putting a trillion dollars worth of cash into the hand, into the accounts of the financial sector. So it's income earning bonds have gone down by a trillion. It's not only can cash has gone up by a trillion. What do they do with the extra cash? They buy shares. So that drove up share prices. That's, that's the basic mechanism of QE. Mm. Um, so I've actually, I was letting a couple of files in the background, pardon me, so I lost part of my train of thought just there. That's fine. Um, but that's, that, that's what QE does. And if they're now doing it again, then they can continue inflating share prices because, again, you give the financial sector a large amount of money. They have two choices. Leave it in money where it doesn't earn any, any return or go and buy risky assets with it. And that appears to be what they're doing now. Yeah. And do you have any view on, on um, if we'll see a similar trend to, to what's happened in previous GFCs and, and in, in the 20s when we saw a slow downturn for the next 12 to 24 months? Do you think that's in play for the stock market as well? Uh, the trouble is the financial, the, the Federal Reserve and, and several other central banks have now decided that their main role in life is maintaining the value of our financial assets. And unfortunately, they've got an unlimited capacity to do that. Um, so if, if they dive in there and they continue pushing the share market up, they can ultimately succeed hmm. because like, they, they were creating $1 trillion worth per, of money per year for QE. And one thing, I, again, I can say in favor of QE, it saves me having to make the case that the, the government create, can create as much money as it needs because I ask people who say, oh, the government got to pay this, all this debt back. I say, okay, uh, what taxes did you pay to finance QE? And I've got this quizzical look and go, huh? I said, exactly. You paid 0.0% tax yeah. because the money was created by double entry bookkeeping. Yep. And exactly no the same thing would be used to pay government debt. So the trouble is they can do this indefinitely. And that's why I, I wouldn't want to bet against the financial markets when the, when the uh, central banks are supporting them because the central bank can do that indefinitely. That said, the real economy can fall over at the same time. That's more likely to happen. And then um, in that situation, uh, I expect governments to react too little, too late. And, but, but again, the government itself can rescue the monetary side of the real economy. What they can't rescue is the physical side. Mm -hmm. Great. And Steve, where can people find out a bit more about you and your wonderful work? Uh, the main place is my Patreon page. So that's www.patreon.com slash Prof. Steve Keen. Uh, again, that's my, that's my source of revenue. I've got, I've got to mention about 1,500 patrons paying me a total of about nine and a half thousand US dollars a month. Uh, but most of my posts, they're free. So if you want to just check out what I've got to argue, you don't have to pay to read the argument. I, uh, I appreciate the support, but uh, I appreciate more people uh, being open to non-orthodox ideas and seeing how what they're listening to in the mainstream is like listening to a tall maker con astronomer tell you how to get to Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, we, need, we need Copernican economics and that's one way to describe what I'm trying to achieve. Steve, it's been very entertaining and insightful. Professor Steve Keane, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Now, if you're listening to the end, thank you so much for listening all the way through and I hope you found it as enjoyable, as insightful as I did. Now, if you have any feedback, ideas, opportunities, or you want to jump on the podcast yourself, please do hit me up at thefeelgoodblueprint at gmail.com. Thanks so much.